Yeah, no, I'm I'm listening. Sorry, I just saw myself in the reflection of a window, and I, I think I'd look really good with hair. No, no, you're right. No, not important right now. Look, I, I know you're my agent, and it's your job to do this, but I've I have a good feeling. I don't think you need to be looking for job openings for me right now. I I'm, I'm here, you know. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll talk to you later. All right, bye. Oh, come on, man. It's the blues. It's one scoreless period. Seriously, stop looking for new gigs. In fact, go call Sweeney right now. Ask him about the extension because I am in Boston Tuesday. Oh, yeah. All right. Talk later. Bye. He really said that? Yeah. Did he say it? in like the angry tone you're using or did he say it in a nice way i don't know incompetent ape might be like a compliment in boston you know no no it's not he's actually being really mean about it uh-huh yeah D did he mention the power play oh, oh you can't repeat what he said when when you brought it up is that a good sign or a bad sign Oh, it's really bad? Like a really bad one? Okay, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe, yeah, the Red Wings, yeah, I, that's actually, I was thinking that too, maybe see if they want to shake things up a little bit. Okay. Yeah, bye. Uh-huh. Yeah. No? He didn't take back what he said? No? But his tone is nicer, right? No? Okay, but the extension? No? Okay, maybe just keep me on speed dial for the next week or two? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. I do think I'd look really good with hair. Low quality fans of a high quality Bruins team, that is a dub! You love to see it. We had, who oh, we were staring down the barrel of a couple of things with the way this game was going after 40 minutes. Now, we did have an absolute disaster. An absolute disaster recently. My fantasy team, I know you don't care. Give me a second. My fantasy team went into last weekend with a 70-point lead Saturday morning. And my opponent, now I didn't have a great fantasy weekend, but my opponent had Soros and Quick go for shutties Saturday night. And after that, Lankanen, who's been lights out for me, goes a negative 6.5 in his start against Edmonton. And we get to Sunday, and I still got a double-digit lead. And I go, you know what? He's got two defensemen and a forward playing. The two defensemen are from the wild. We're still good. I've got four players playing. One of them is Jesper Bratt. Like, we're fine. No way the hockey gods do me this hard. And, of course, he's going to pick up Blackwood, who I just needed I needed Bratt to beat him once, basically, to win this week. And instead posts a 44-save shutout. He gets three shutouts in a row, two by backup goaltenders in fantasy to win the week by like 15 points when it's all said and done. Statistically improbable to have three shutouts, two by backups in the same weekend. For them all to be playing for the same fantasy team? Ugh, unbelievable. Also, our special teams are really bad, and Hampus Lindholm got hurt. So, like, there's some other disasters that you probably care about, but I feel like you wanted to know all that. You wanted to know all that. Screw you, knuckle puck. Next meeting, the, the cantaloupe cockatoos, uh, they're going down. The Dubaroonie and cheeses are coming for you. This is the best part about having a YouTube channel, is I can say whatever inane nonsense I want to on it. Thank you for indulging me for a moment. Do you want to talk about the Boston Bruins uh, and how... Things weren't going great 
They weren't. Second period, second intermission, I should say, came around, and the Fire Monty stuff had picked back up on social media. The Sweeney stuff had picked back up. Everything was awful. The sky was falling, and quite frankly, nobody was all that wrong about it because the Boston Bruins were looking bad. They were looking terrible. But we're going to get there. Let's talk about this Blues team for a second. Who suck, by the way. The Blues suck. And yeah, Blues fans, if you're watching this, you absolutely have the opportunity to go, uh, have you seen your team? Doesn't make your team suck less. Your team sucks. Anyway, the Blues have the 32nd ranked power play in the team. Dead last going into this game. They had not scored a power play goal at home yet this season. We have the 29th ranked power play. Pretty close. They have the 23rd ranked penalty kill. We have the 24th. They're 25th in goals for. We are 26th. They're 27th in goals allowed. We are 22nd. We're going into this uh, this meeting with a record of 7-7-2. Seven, seven, and two. They're coming in with a record, I believe, of 7-8. and eight. <laughs> They're goaltending. Binner has an 886 save percentage in 10 games played. Swayman has an 896 save percentage in 11 games played. Hoffer, their backup, has a 903 in 5 games played. Corpusolo, our backup, has a 900 in 5 games played. They are 4-6-0 in their last 10 going into this one. We're 4-5-1 in our last 10 going into this one. Oh my god, we're the East Coast Blues. These teams are both bad in the same ways. I mean, this is an atrocity. This is this is a toilet bowl kind of game. Not good. Now, of course, we as Bruins fans think our team is on the upswing. I don't know how Blues fans feel, but I did feel like we were building something going into this game. I was like, this is a, this is kind of like a must win. Feels a little overdoing it. But please win so we don't have to deal with some of the nonsense that we're going to say after the game if we don't win, which we're going to say anyway. But I'm begging. I'm begging for a win here. Before the game, we did get some news that was less than ideal. Morgan Geeky is slotting back into the lineup. That's not the less than ideal news. But Morgan Geeky had been scratched for being so unplayable offensively. I want to make that very clear because defensively is still solid that he'd been scratched for three games straight. He's going to insert back into the lineup on the top line. Okay. Tyler Johnson's going to move to the third, where on the right wing of Coyle and Frederick. I think that's basically where he belongs. That's fine. So the new top line is Geeky, Zaka, Pasternak. Then it's Marshan, Lindholm, Brazo, Frederick, Coyle, Johnson, Beecher, Kostelik, Kepke, Zadorov, McAvoy, Lindholm, Carlo, Lorai, Watherspoon. And Swayman's going to get the start. So... Geeky gets slotted in. Who gets pushed out, you may ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. It was Matthew Patra, who, in my opinion, did need a little reset. But in my head, I was like, hey, what if we put him with some players who could actually finish some of the chances that this dude's creating? Because he has got to be getting real frustrated right now. And it looks like he's holding the puck longer because he doesn't trust his line mates to actually finish any of the dang chances he's getting them. Monty agreed. He went... Yeah, he does need a reset. I love everything you just said. I'm going to send him down to Providence. I don't... I don't get it, man. I don't really get it. And I have a statistic of why I don't get it. According to Natural Stat Trick, which is a great website for some really great analytics, there is not a player who has a higher on-ice expected goals for percentage that plays for the Bruins than Matthew Patra. Meaning... When Matthew Potra's on the ice, the expected goals for the Boston Bruins is 56% what the numbers are at 5-on-5. Five five. No other forward has an expected goals percentage as high as Matthew Potra. I don't think Potra's the problem with the offense right now, nor the defense. Don't think it's him. Now, we can take that with a little asterisk because he does start over 60% of his shifts in the Ozone. To give you a benchmark, we could use Elias Lindholm, who's starting over 70% of his shifts in the Ozone, and he ranks 8th 
on the squad in expected goals for percentage. That's probably not ideal to be sending the guy who ranks number one down. Probably not ideal. To take this just a little farther, Natural Stat Trick has this information again, that Pasta, Elias Lindholm, and Matthew Patra rank 1, 2, and 3 in offensive zone shift starts. Meaning their shift, that's where it begins, whether it's on the fly or whether it's face-offs. Those combined, this is the percentages respectively to that order I just gave. Pasta's 73%, Elias Lindholm 71%, and Patra is 65%. On ice, expected goals for percentage, the same stat I just used, at 5-on-5 five five for these three players. Pasta, 73% offensive zone shift starts, is 49.1% expected goals for percentage. Elias Lindholm is 518 and then Pacha is 56%. Now look, I know that like there's plenty to go nuance to go into that right the Padres getting hit high there's all sorts of conversations about whether or not he can stay healthy I get it he's going against different competition because you refuse to put him in the top six for some inane reason I get it but analytically at least for the public models Patra's not the issue and to send him down pretty silly pretty silly there was one positive change that lasted for a little while uh, Hampus Lindholm takes over on the power play, on the top power play unit for McAvoy. That's a coaching change. Let's talk about this game, shall we? Puck drops! And one minute in, Brazo, Marshand, and Elias Lindholm connect in a transition chance to give Elias Lindholm a wide open chance from the center of the slot, and he goes high and wide. I don't lose faith this easily. That's not my vibe. I'm an optimistic dude. In fact, the entire time during the second intermission when this team looked like it was about to drop it in regulation to the Blues because they couldn't get anything going, I was trying to find a way, like, how do I do this video and be positive? Because right now I feel like I want to die. So how do I do this? Positivity is the mindset. One minute in, I kind of had to put my head in my hands because I'm just so sick of watching this team from the dead center of the slot miss the net. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me because they're all professional hockey players and they're all, you know, should be hitting the net. 3.51 in, Lori takes a cross check from Tropachenko. Love that name. We're going to go on the power play. The power play is not good. And directly after this kill, I wrote, because in my head it's like we're killing a penalty, Directly after the power play ends, Lorai is chasing a loose puck through the slot and all the way to the right wall, completely forgetting the fact that he is, in fact, a defenseman. And, of course, this springs a two-on-one the other way with a great, great pass that turns into a Kairu breakaway. Just a really impressive pass by Neighbors. And he's going to go wide on the breakaway, but Swayman is super aggressive, definitely affecting this. We're going to move on at 0-0. Zero, zero. 8-23 in. Joseph is going to go for high sticking. We're going to go power play. Lamau, nope, was my note there. Probably not a good sign, but we definitely didn't score on it. 4-0-2 left. Brazil is going to go for hooking. We're going to the penalty kill. Hampus, during the penalty kill, blocks a shot. It looks like it hits him right in the knee. He limps to the bench, does not return at all this game. He has a lower body injury. We're going to talk about that in a bit. We do kill that penalty. We're going to go to the second period. 1-0-2 in. Suter is going to go for slashing on a contested breakaway for Pasta. We're going to the power play. Great opportunity for this power play. As Boston gets the puck in, it's a cross-crease pass from Marshand to Zaka, who is a backdoor tap-in that's wide open. Easy peasy, 1-0. Except for the fact that Pasta is also sprinting backdoor with a defender on his back, and they both go to hit it, meaning Zaka and Pasta, and the ending result is they just smack it back across the crease, doesn't even get on net. So it's not 1-0, it's still 0-0 because this team could not be more out of sync. There's no continuity. There's no continuity whatsoever in this team. And it is literally killing the fan base, I think. I, I, I'm watching the light die out of out of these fans' eyes. It's Social media is a wild place during a Bruins game right now. It's very, very unfortunate. 824 in, high sticking on Kepke. We're going to the penalty kill. One minute into the penalty kill, the Blues are set up. Buknevich in the right dot, flicks it past Zadorov. Zadorov is like, kind of, he gets a little far from the net front presence, but he's like still trying to block the pass to the to the bumper, or, or not the bumper, but yes, the bumper, in the slot. And, he, and the second he moves the stick one way, Buknevich passes it right past him to Cairo, who's in that slot bumper position. He's going to hammer on net. Save's going to get made, but the rebound's going to bounce over to, uh, I don't even know who dunks this right now. Hold on. 
Shen. Shen gets a tap in. It bounces off of Swayman's blocker and right to him. He gets to dunk it. The power play just gives up too many. The power play. The penalty kill gives up way too many chances. Really high danger chances. I think I have to change my view of the penalty kill. I keep saying, like, this penalty kill has to be good. It's going to shake this off. It's going to be good. It's It's got too much size, too much length, too much ability to clear the puck to be bad. The penalty kill might be bad. I mean, the numbers certainly say it is, but I just, I can't believe it's this bad. It's really bad. I'm pretty sure away from home ice, it's sub 70% at this point. That's really bad. <laughs> We're going to move on. One minute after they score that first goal of the game, power play goal for them, it is their first power play goal at home this season. Remember, this was the league worst power play. One minute after they score that, uh, Pasta's going to go for high sticking. We're going to go back to the penalty kill. The momentum is completely sucked out of the Bruins, who at 5-on-5 five five were playing decently. They were playing well enough. 140 later, during this penalty kill, the league's worst power play comes into the zone, pushes the puck down to the side of the net where Sunquist quickly hits it to Saad in the slot. He's going to try to hammer this on net. It's going to get deflected. It's going to bounce down to the right side, just below the right circle for Holloway. None of the Bruins react in time at all. Everyone's stuck in cement. The crease front is wide open. Holloway's going to pass it right through the front of the crease to uh, Saad, who just gets a tap in here. And it's 2-0, or sorry, to Sunquist. It's 2-0. Power play goal for them again. It's two power play goals for them. The first two at home this season for the Blues. <laughs> Great. I gotta say, the reaction from the fan base was pretty, pretty much like throw the arms up. It, it felt like... It felt like we were right back to is Monty making it on the plane, right? It felt like that was it. I mean, 30 seconds later, Fosca's going to go for high sticking. We're going to go to the power play. You just got scored on twice by the league's worst power play. And you didn't even manage a shot on this upcoming power play. The period ends 2-0. And genuinely, I do think people were like, does Monty get on the plane? Do they pay for his ticket back? Like, it's over. This team can't score. This team has terrible special teams that somehow are continuing to struggle even with no changes made. And we finally had the Hampus change made for power play one. And of course, he gets injured right away. Uh, the feeling, at least on social media, was just flabbergasted. Just they couldn't, you couldn't watch it anymore. I think Ty Anderson nailed this. At the end of the second period, he, I th I'm paraphrasing, but he said... Kind of the worst thing you can say about the Bruins right now is they're not enjoyable to watch at all. It is, and I put this in my note, it was a chore watching a lot of this game. I mean, I, I was struggling not to check my phone every 30 seconds. And yeah, obviously our attention span is that of rodents at this point because of all the media that we take in. But I, this team is not enjoyable to watch for large stretches, not just because they're bad, right? Like not because you're losing but because they just don't function. Like you watch huge chunks of the game go by and like there's no scoring chances, there's no structure, it's just flailing. It's constant flailing. And we were at this such a negative point and we go into the third period and no one believes other than Razor, I think was the one, I didn't pay a ton of attention to the intermission show, but I think Razor during the intermission was like, I think this is going to be their first comeback of the season, which this is our first third period comeback of the season. He nailed it. Other than him, I don't think anyone had faith for the Bruins actually putting together a win. And who could blame them? This team, to score two goals plus in one period, has been a nightmare for this team this year. And we're 17 games in now. Either way, third period starts and 4.53 in. Pasta strips Pareko of the puck in the neutral zone, turns it into a 2v1 cross slot pass that gets deflected, but not enough. And Geeky, Geeky who's playing on the top line, gets this skittering puck and slams it blocker side. And you might think to yourself, this is the end times. Geeky just scored a goal playing on the top line after being so ostracized offensively because he was just non-functioning. It's the end times. Don't you worry. It may be 2-1. But two minutes later, Pasta almost gets a breakaway. 
Defenders draped all over him. He has to hit the break, spin, and he finds Geeky for another cross slot slamming in opportunity. And Geeky just heals it and it goes wide. There you go. It's not the end times. Geeky is still there for you. He's still there for you. He just had a lucky moment. No, honestly, if this wakes up Geeky, that's huge. Because Geeky turning back into the 20 goal scorer that we believe that he could be in a middle six role, preferably on the third line, um, which 20 goals is tough with those minutes, but, you know, huge. It would be huge for this team. I would love it if Geeky woke up. Because, you'll remember last year, I didn't have an issue with Geeky. I had an issue with Geeky in our top six. Geeky's a versatile third liner, who I really like having on this team as much as I dunk on him. He needs to be on the third line, though, for this team to be, like, championship caliber. <laughs> if you're forcing him into the top six because you need him there, it means your team's not good enough to be championship caliber. That's a different conversation here. Still, he gets us started. He should get first star. I don't really care how this went for the rest of the game. That jump started the team hugely. It's 2-1. 9.15 in, Brazo and Marchand barrel into the offensive zone, forcing a turnover and collecting the puck. After multiple whacks and a weird little self-pass by Marchand, he's going to have the puck in the right dot. And he's just going to feed it back up to McAvoy, who's at the top of the slot, distance from the net. And I just like to think McAvoy said, fuck it, and just slammed the absolute crap out of this thing, top glove. Binner can't catch up. It's 2-2. And this game's a brand new game midway through the third period. And not only that, but the Bruins have every single ounce of momentum. Because the Blues have sucked this year. Not sucked. They've been 500, basically. But the special teams have been atrocious. They can't finish games out. They don't feel good about their game at all. We can connect with that in a way. But when you give up a two-goal lead midway through the third period, you don't feel good about anything. All the conversations we were having after the second period into the intermission about this team, Blues fans are probably having, having right now. I swear I used to be able to speak like a normal human being. I apologize for this. 147 left. What a sequence. The Bruins are pushing. They've owned the puck for the past few minutes. They've been dominant. Lorai is going to go way down to collect a loose puck that's below the goal line on the right side of the offensive zone. And he's going to go no look through the legs, fling it back into the slot where Geeky is getting manhandled. But he's fighting the good fight. This goal does not happen without Geeky fighting off two big bodies. And they're demolishing each other. That's not a comfortable place to be, but Geeky's sacrificing to get this play happening. Puck gets into this scramble. It gets bumped out to McAvoy, who's flying in and looks like he's about to absolutely smash this thing. It's going to hit a body. That body's going to break. But instead, fakes the slap and then whips it over to Pasternak, who's in his typical left circle. He's going to hammer this blocker side. And Bennington gets a ton of this. He squeezes it. He gets so much of this puck. And it still somehow dribbles in. Pasta's first goal in a while, seven or eight games, I think. But... Just a massive lead with buck 47 left. We aren't able to get the empty netter, but we do we do win the game in regulation after being down two in the third period. This was massive because even the beat writers are on Twitter in the second, basically actually during the third, where McAvoy tied the game and the Bruins beat writers were like, that might be the most important goal of the season so far. And I think they're alluding to Monty's season. This game is still, I'm, st I'm still not sitting here being like, if we lost this game, I'm looking at Monty to be fired, right? I am looking at Monty very critically, but there's so much wrong with the team. Every loss, especially ones where you look like absolute ass through 40 minutes, it stings that much worse, and you're trying to find any solution, anything you could grab onto that might fix it. And the coach firing is pretty much first up in that regard. We don't have to worry about that right now, by the way. We won the game. Who cares? Let's talk about some game notes. Want to point something out. The fourth line hasn't been able to continue scoring, but that's, like, very expected. But they do continue to be good. 
and get the puck in deep and allow for changes for our offensive, our higher offensive members to cycle in once the puck gets in deep. And they do that because they know how they want to play and they execute what they want to be. There's no extra bullshit or concern about feeding some player for a big play or for them to make a superhero play. They hit, they dump it in, they chase it, they hit again, and they get the puck to the net. And if that doesn't work, they start it all over again. The fourth line, I think the reason that everyone's really enjoying them so much now, once they've stopped scoring like they were, is because they still continue to simply do their job and do it well. And everyone can just respect that it's a tenacity that's not being matched anywhere else in the lineup. I want to give fourth line kudos again. Even though they're not scoring, they do continuously make good plays and are, are fierce against other teams' top lines. I feel really good about that line, even though they're not scoring now, which again was expected. The Hampus injury is the biggest game note because I'm not so sure if the Bruins can survive an extended injury there. Peaks out week to week. Your next up is like Ian Mitchell. I don't know, man. It's not It's not good. And Hampus has been our best, arguably our best defenseman early on in the season when everyone else has been shaking off some pretty serious rust. I'm, I'm really concerned what we hear about this. I'm very concerned. I'm hoping for a day-to-day -day kind of thing. We'll see what happens. It's scary. And maybe we'll have news from Monty after the game, but it sounds like they ruled him out so quickly that we're not going to have news right away. Other game notes. Why does no one on this team trust anyone else to do their job? I've noticed that defensively, in the neutral zone, and offensively, there's a lot of puck watching, a lot of gliding closer to the play, forgetting the zone you're supposed to be covering, forgetting uh, the player you're supposed to be covering, just forgetting your role. It feels like everyone's constantly waiting for that player to lose the puck so that they can come in and help, which is a terrible idea. Terrible idea for an effective hockey team. Really weird. Really, really weird. Feels like there's not a lot of trust to go around in this lineup right now. And I think that change would actually go a long way. Other game notes, Pasta went nuclear. Pasta went absolutely nuclear. According to Natural Stat Trick, when he was on the ice, we had a 97% uh, expected goals for. His line didn't, like, when he was on the ice, nothing was given up the other way. And he, I think we were out chancing them 22 to 6. I think those were shot attempts while he was on the ice. His line scored two goals, two both of which he had a primary role in, whether a goal or an assist. I mean, we can talk, we can complain about Pasta. I know a lot of people like to complain about Pasta, and he deserves it sometimes. He doesn't deserve it in this one. Absolutely not. Honestly, what a game. What a comeback. That was scary. There were some concerns. But a win's a win's a win. A dub's a dub's a dub. We take him how we can get him. Like, comment, subscribe. Nailed it. Go Bees. Go Bees! Of course, we have to give a huge thank you to everyone who's supporting this channel, especially the high-quality inspectors, our top-line tier members, Chris and Erica, Jeff with a G, Tommy Braga, The Bugman, Roland22, GD Viperworks, Len Cruz, Moonlighter TV, Brock Nope, Han Slomo, Coach D, The Atomic Lizard, Bradley Johnson, Aaron Adams, Brett Arney, Pincent, Adam Ella, Big Bad Bruin, and Nick Zatrulo. Thank you all so much for supporting the channel. You're all studs and studettes. And of course, a huge thank you to the Stallions, our all-star tier members, Joel, Dutes42, Heil E. Coyote, Darren Woodbury, Abraxion, John Kirk, Michael DiPaolo, Wolf Warrior, Vinny, Adrian Winter, Tupton Ditashi, Nightmare Eco, Bruin Smash, DeKingery, The Only Newts, A Tasty Snack, Boston Stringler, Matthew Gallagher, Dash Riprock, Jacob Pratt, and Jeremy. You are all absolute legends. I appreciate you eternally, and as usual, Go Bees!